efforts to improve medical care for wounded veterans at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and a government report released today on veterans care. John Tierney chairs the Oversight Subcommittee on National Security. This is about two hours. You've been kind enough to come here and give us your time and we appreciate that. Um, we're going to begin our hearing entitled Third Walter Reed Oversight Hearing, Keeping the Nation's Promise to Our Soldiers. Uh, I'm going to ask unanimous consent uh, that only the chairman and ranking member of the subcommittee and the chairman and ranking member of the full oversight and government reform committee be allowed to make opening statements. And without objection, that will be ordered. And I ask unanimous consent also that the written statement of former Senator Bob Dole and former Secretary Donna Shalala, co-chairs of the President's Commission on Care for America's Returning Wounded Warriors, be submitted for the record. And without objection, that also is ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton, be allowed to participate in this hearing in accordance with our rules. She will be allowed to question the witnesses after all official members of the subcommittee have first had their turn. And I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all the members of the subcommittee will be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. And uh, without objection, that is all ordered. Well, good morning. Uh, you know, back on March 5th, uh, we were all aware that we held a hearing at Walter Reed at the Medical Center and heard from Specialist Jeremy Duncan, from Annette and Del McLeod, and Staff Sergeant Dan Shannon about their experiences with the military health care. The mold, the red tape, the frustrations, all of the situations that were reported and which frustrated uh, all of you as well as the members of this panel. In preparation for the hearing today, we reached back out to all of those witnesses to find out what was doing, what going on with them, to ask if there's anything else they needed for help, to get their take on how things have improved or not improved, and what our committee needed to focus on in their opinions with respect to our sustained and hopefully vigorous oversight. Jeremy Duncan is at Fort Campbell fighting to rejoin his unit overseas in Iraq. Annette and Del McLeod have noticed some improvements, but they're still navigating through the retirement compensation process. And Sergeant Shannon's most recent experiences with military health care were recounted in the Washington Post less than two weeks ago. He's trying to leave Walter Reed, but he has faced some additional bureaucratic roadblocks, which I think General Schoomaker can report have been overcome at this point in time. Sergeant Shannon did tell us something that I think gets to the heart of this matter. And he said, recommendations mean nothing until something is done with them. And that's exactly what this oversight is all about. At an April 17th hearing, we heard the recommendations of the Defense Secretary's Independent Review Group. Since then, the President's Commission, led by former Senator Dole and Secretary Shalala, issued their own recommendations. The purpose of today's hearing will be to ensure that these recommendations and the human faces and stories of our nation's wounded soldiers behind them aren't ignored or forgotten, which unfortunately has too often happened in the past, and also to make sure that our government is moving swiftly to address all of the problems that were identified. This morning, we'll hear from top directors with the Government Accountability Office, Congress's investigatory arm, on where we're at. Instead of yet another commission or panel issuing recommendations, today we'll get the first independent assessment of the progress we've made and of the challenges and obstacles that may lie ahead. We're also going to hear directly from key officials in the Army, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Veterans Affairs who have been tasked with fixing the problems and implementing all of the various recommendations. We've been told time and time again that things are improving and that next to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, taking care of our wounded soldiers is the highest priority of our military. While I believe some progress has been made, especially through some of the Army's efforts to throw significant additional resources, energy and manpower at the problem, I'd like to take a few moments to highlight some lingering concerns. We don't do this to focus on the negative. I do this because taking care of our wounded heroes is too important to not demand that we strive for the highest levels of care and respect and that we do so with a sense of real urgency. A number of us on the subcommittee vo visited Walter Reed earlier this week. We had the privilege and honor to meet with our brave men and women recovering there. And here's what we heard. First, the disability review process is broken, plain and simple. It's burdensome, archaic, adversarial. We also heard stories of wounded so soldiers so frustrated that they would tell us, and I quote, they were just giving up. Second, the challenges we face with traumatic brain injury, TBI, and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, are immense. We heard stories about TBI stigma. That is, the soldiers were afraid to come forward for help out of fear that they would get kicked out of the military. And third, quality control and oversight will be absolutely key going forward. 
While the Army has thrown significant bodies at the problem, we need systems to identify and reward great performers and to identify and deal with those treating our wounded soldiers with anything but respect. These challenges and countless others won't be easy to overcome. For instance, we have known for a long time that the disability review process is broken, but we haven't had the will and the sustained focus to fix it in the past. Will the newly created Senior Oversight Committee, made up of top officials from the Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration, be up to the task of urgently and finally fixing and reinventing the disability review process? Will our military be able to hire additional top nurses and psychologists, a key that the GAO has highlighted? Finally, what are we doing now to plan for the future? In my district of Massachusetts, instead of expanding and enhancing health services and retaining specialized personnel, the Veterans Administration officials continue to push for consolidation. They are limiting options for our veterans when, unfortunately, they will clearly be in high demand for years and years to come. As Chairman of the National Security Subcommittee, we have made it a top priority to ensure that there is sustained congressional oversight and accountability so that all those who risk their lives for the country receive the care and respect that they deserve. And I have been routinely impressed by the seriousness and the vigor that the other members of this subcommittee have approached when they are dealing with this issue. It is vital that we continue to have open and public hearings and that we hear from rank and file soldiers as well as high ranking generals and department heads. We have already had three hearings and today's hearing will certainly not be the last. We hope that in the months to come we won't have to hear about how Sergeant Shannon had yet another bureaucratic roadblock thrust in his way in his three-year odyssey to navigate the military health care system. Rather, we hope to hear about how enormously difficult problems were finally overcome with dedication, hard work and ingenuity. So I want to thank all these witnesses whose hard work and ingenuity certainly will be put to the test as we meet this task. And now I uh, will yield to uh, the ranking member of the committee, uh, Mr. Davis, for his opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Tierney. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Waxman, for his leadership and our ranking member, Chris Shays. At the subcommittee's hearings in March and April, we heard about ambitious plans for improvements in the medical processing of wounded soldiers, and we heard promises to pursue these reforms with, uh, with urgency. Prior to that, the Government Forum Committee heard many similar plans and promises, starting as far back as 2004, when we first tried to help soldiers caught between systems and policies not designed to handle the types and the numbers of wounds inflicted by this new global war. After so many promises but so little progress, we need to start seeing concrete results. And I applaud your persistence, uh, Mr. Chairman, in pursuing these issues. The report of the President's Commission on Care for America's Returning Wounded Warriors, released in July, sets forth another list of findings and recommendations for executive and congressional action. The Commission also urges those reforms be pursued with a sense of urgency and strong leadership. We agree. One of the most important of the Commission's recommendations restates the longstanding call to overhaul and standardize the disability rating systems used by the Department of Defense and the Departments of Veterans Affairs. Every week, my staff still hears appalling stories from wounded soldiers caught in DOD medical evaluation and physical evaluation board processes. They are trapped in a system they don't understand and that doesn't understand them. The process is seldom the same twice in a row and often yields two different ratings, one from DOD and the other from VA. Having to run that double gauntlet causes additional pain and confusion, literally adding insult to injury. This has to stop. The Commission is recommending a single, comprehensive, standardized medical examination that DOD administrators and uses to determine medical fitness and that VA uses to establish an initial disability level. VA would assume all responsibility for establishing permanent disability ratings and for the administration of all disability compensation and benefits programs. I look forward to hearing from our DOD and VA witnesses today about a firm implementation deadline details on how the integration of these evaluations will occur and what performance standards will be put in place to make sure the consolidation serves the near and long-term needs of veterans. We also need to hear more about the Army's medical action plan, a roadmap the Army has created to address patient administrative care at Walter Reed and at all Army medical treatment facilities. The plan is comprehensive in scope and includes stabilized command and control structures, prioritizing patient support with a focus on family needs developing training and doctrine, facilitating a continuum of care, and improving transfers to the Department of Veterans Affairs. These are worthy and long overdue goals. But at this point, they seem frustratingly incremental and risk drawing energy and resources from the broader systematic changes that I think are clearly needed. 
And even those goals have to be viewed with skepticism, looking back on more than three years of quarterly reports, uh, document uh, missing deadlines, and glacial progress uh, that changed the, the process but didn't always improve the product uh, for the Army's wounded warriors. Clearly, the Army has dedicated considerable manpower and resources to the new warrior transition units and patient services. But better training and clear lines of responsibility and accountability are still needed. Diagnosis and treatment for this war's signature wounds, traumatic brain injuries, and post-traumatic stress disorder are still far from adequate. And those looking to find their way home from war are still hitting dead ends in a looping, baffling maze of medical and physical disability assessment procedures. When a truck or plane gets damaged in battle, we fix it. Honor demands we do everything possible to fix the most precious assets we send into harm's way, the men and the women who volunteer to fight for us. I look forward to the testimony of all of our witnesses today and to a very frank discussion on how we can accomplish uh, recommended reforms quickly and make sure all of our wounded warriors receive the care they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. This hearing today is in the tradition of our committee's oversight with regard to military health care problems. Long before the public ever heard about the problems of Walter Reed under the leadership of uh, Congressman Tom Davis, we uh, held hearings on the important uh, problems that Guard and Reserve troops were having with health care and military benefits. And Chairman Tierney, your subcommittee held the first hearings uh, of the problems at Walter Reed. And you have continued to be a leader on this issue. I want to commend you for that. In May, uh, the full committee had a hearing on the hundreds of thousands of soldiers who may be returning from Iraq and Afghanistan suffering from PTSD and other mental health problems. Well, this committee's efforts have helped uncover both new and longstanding problems with the military health care system. Uh, this oversight is some of the most important work that this committee does. Few causes are more noble than giving our injured soldiers the care they deserve. Despite the increased attention, the pace of change at DOD and VA is intolerably slow. Again and again we see the same thing. Blue Ribbon task forces like the West Marsh Commission on Walter Reed or the Dole Shalala Commission on Military Health Care provide detailed roadmaps to better care. DOD and VA representatives come before Congress and insist that things are getting better. And still the horror stories about problems with the military, military's health care system continue. Here is just some of the new and disturbing information we have received over the last several months. We learned from the Washington Post that Staff Sergeant John Daniel Shannon who testified about his problems at Walter Reed before our, our committee in March, remained stuck in bureaucratic limbo at Walter Reed, unable to obtain his discharge, obtain VA benefits, or return to his family and pick up his life. We received deeply troubling reports from Fort Carson, Colorado, indicating that the leadership there seems to utterly lack understanding, a basic understanding, of the problems faced by ill and injured soldiers. Whistleblowers, and investigators, and struggling families have told the committee that soldiers with PTSD and PTI are being dishonorably discharged under the pretense of having pre existing personality disorders. We have heard of one soldier who was ordered back to Iraq despite a diagnosis of PTSD and TBI. And we have heard press reports indicating that one commander at the base recommended discharging mentally ill soldiers simply as a way to get rid of, and I quote, Deadwood. We have heard from VA that they have over 1,200 unfilled psychologists, social workers, and psychiatrist positions within their ranks, and that the VA is unable to provide even the most rudimentary estimates of the number of soldiers who will need mental health care or the cost for such treatment. And we have heard reports from the Army that suicide rates among soldiers are at their highest levels in 26 years, while 20 percent of Army psychologist positions are unfilled and morale among Army mental health care providers continues to sink. 
will hear testimony from GAO and others today pointing to other persistent or emerging problems at VA and, DO, VA and DOD. Well, I, I'm looking forward to hearing testimony from all of our witnesses today, and I'm happy that we'll have at least some good news, but I continue to be frustrated with the pace of improvement, and I worry that after five years of war, our military health care system is overstretched with bigger problems coming down the line as soldiers are forced to serve more and longer deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. In the coming years, hundreds of thousands of soldiers will return home and will need DOD and VA care for injuries or mental illness. We can't let these soldiers and their families down. I want to thank you for holding this hearing today, and I'm looking forward to seeing how we can make things better. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, Mr. Shays, who joined us earlier in the week out at Walter Reed and has been uh, consistently involved with, with this oversight process as well. Uh, do you have an opening statement, Mr. Shays? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tierney, for your commitment to our subcommittee's ongoing inquiry into the medical care for the men and women of our armed forces. Previous hearings taught us well about the challenges facing our wounded warriors under current Army, Department of Defense, and Department of Veterans Affairs processes. We heard from many who were failed by the system and challenged those responsible to address these failings. We will do that again today when we question the current commander of Walter Reed Army Medical Center about the new Army Medical Action Plan aimed at addressing shortcomings at Walter Reed and other Army medical facilities. In our congressional oversight responsibilities, it is important we focus on the Department of Defense's wounded, ill, and injured senior oversight committee's efforts to carry out the recommendations contained in the President's Commission on Care for America's Returning Wounded Warriors commonly known as the Dole Shalala Commission. In July, this commission released findings that are similar to what we found during our committee's initial investigations begun in the spring of 2004 and are comparable to those we heard from the independent review group this past spring. But the Dole Shalala Commission's recommendations for executive and congressional action are more aggressive than those in the independent review group. Their implementation will require a collaborative commitment from the Department of Defense, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and especially from congressional committees. Most of the real work still lies before us. As recommended in the Dole Shalala report, we must ask some tough questions. Can we completely restructure the disability and compensation system of the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Veterans Affairs in time to help the number of wounded currently in and entering the systems? Can we create comprehensive recovery plans for every serious injured service member and create a cadre of well-trained recovery coordinators for all stages in a wounded serviceman's life? Who will be responsible for seeing that these plans are carried out between departments? Will this cadre of coordinators come, where will this cadre of, co of coordinators come from? How will they be trained? We have learned the wounds of war extend far beyond the physical, with many patients struggling to cope with the devastating emotional impacts of war. One of the most chronic outpatient issues for our recovering soldiers has been the di di diagnosis, and treatment, diagnosis and treatment of traumatic brain injury, TBI, and the post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Central to the military creed is the promise to leave no soldier or Marine on the battlefield. But if we do not appropriately recognize and treat all wounds, including the issues associated with post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury, we do precisely that. We leave them behind. And so we ask the question, how will DOD and the VA now aggressively prevent and treat post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury? What standards of diagnosis and treatment will be created? Who will pay for this treatment? How will DOD and the VA move quickly to integrate medical information and data between their organizations in order to get clinical data to all essential health, administrative, and benefits professional that need it? I look forward to hearing our Government Accountability Office witness recommendations about what the federal government can do to address the needs of our wounded warriors. We owe the wounded warrior men and women of our armed services and their families, as has been pointed out already, more than we have given them to date. I am told the President is committed to implementation of the Dole Shalala recommendations, and I know the subcommittee is also committed in ensuring we provide the best possible care to 
to our brave men and women. I look forward to hearing the testimony from our distinguished panel. And I just close, Mr. Chairman, and again, thank you for your work on this and the work of your staff and our staff. That one of my staff received an email from a soldier in Iraq who, upon hearing on this hearing this morning, said, quote, you, the American people, gave us a mission to fix Iraq. We are accomplishing that mission. What we expect from you, the American people, is to help fix us when we come home broken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Now the subcommittee will, in fact, receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. Uh, I'd like to begin by introducing the witnesses on our panel. We have John Pendleton, Acting Director of the Health Care Department at the United States Government Accountability Office. Uh, with him is Daniel Bertoni, Director of the Education Workforce and Income Security Department at the United States Government Accountability Office. Major General Eric B. Schoomaker, uh, MD, Commanding General of North Atlantic Regional Medical Command and Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Uh, the Honorable Michael S. Dominguez, Principal Deputy, Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, the United States Department of Defense, and Rear Admiral Patrick Dunn, retired, Assistant Secretary for Policy and Planning at the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us. It is the policy of the subcommittee to square you in before you testify, so I ask that you please stand and raise your right hands. And if there are any other persons who might be assisting you in responding to questions, would they also please uh, rise and raise their right hands. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, your full written statements, of course, as most of you know from previous experience here, will be submitted on the record and accepted. Uh, so we'll ask that your oral remarks uh, stay as close as you can to five minutes uh, and give us a little synopsis of what you have to say. Mr. Pendleton, I know that you and Mr. Bertoni come as a team, and I understand that you'll be presenting remarks, uh, and Mr. Bertoni may not. Uh, but in that case, we'll give you a little leeway on the five minutes, as we will for all the witnesses in any regard. Uh, and thank you and the General Accountability Office for your, uh, your fairness in your report and the depth of your work. And I'd ask you at this point in time to proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here today as you continue your oversight of DOD and VA efforts to improve health care and other services. As the situation at Walter Reed came to light earlier this year, the gravity and implications of many longstanding issues became clear. I visited Walter Reed last month, as I know many of you have, and learned firsthand from some of the soldiers there just how far the system still has to go. I am pleased to be joined by my colleague Dan Bertoni, who leads our disability work at GAO. Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Dan to make a few comments because he's our disability expert. That's I'll provide fine. an overview first and then turn it over to Dan to focus on That's disability. That's fine. Thank you. Please take note that the findings that we are presenting today are preliminary, based in large part on ongoing reviews. Much of the information is literally days old, and the situation is evolving rapidly. Efforts thus far have been on two separate but related tracks. First, I will cover the Army's service-specific efforts. Then I will cover the collective DOD-VA efforts. The Army's focused on its issues through its medical action plan. The centerpiece of that plan is the new warrior transition units. The Army formed these to blend active and reserve component soldiers into one unit and to improve overall care for its wounded warriors. While these units have been formed on paper, Many still have significant staff shortfalls. As of mid-September, just over half of the total required personnel were in place in these units. However, many of those personnel that were in place had been borrowed, presumably temporarily, from other units. Ultimately, hundreds of nurses, enlisted and officer leaders, social workers, and other highly sought-after specialists, like the mental health professionals that will help with uh, TBI and PTSD will be needed. The Army told us it plans to have all the positions filled by January 2008 and is planning to draw these personnel from both the active and reserve component as well as from the civilian marketplace. Filling all the slots may prove difficult. As I think everyone knows, the Army is stretched thin due to continuing overseas commitments. Furthermore, the military must compete in a civilian market that will pay top dollar for many of these health professionals. 
This is an area we intend to monitor closely as we continue our work. Now, if I could, I'm going to briefly describe the broader efforts. Through the newly created Senior Oversight Committee, DOD and VA are working together to address the broader systemic problems. One of the key issues being taken on by the Senior Oversight Committee is improving the continuity of care for returning service members. In plain English, this is about helping the service members move from inpatient to a less regimented outpatient status and navigate within and across two entirely different departments, DOD and VA, as well as possibly out to the private sector to obtain needed care. This can be quite complex. To improve continuity, the Dole Shalala Commission recommended that recovery plans be crafted to guide care for seriously injured service members and that senior level recovery coordinators be put in place to oversee those plans. DOD and VA, VA intend to adopt this recommend, recommendation, but key questions remain unanswered. For example, it is unclear exactly which service members will be served by this recovery coordinator, and without an understanding of the proposed population, it is impossible to understand other, or, uh, excuse me, uh, answer other fundamental questions, like how many recovery coordinators will ultimately be needed. It is also unclear how the Army's efforts will be synchronized with the broader efforts. This is important so that service members do not have too many case managers, potentially resulting in overlaps and confusion. Mr. Chairman, given the complexity and urgency of these issues, it is critical for top leaders to ensure the goals are achieved expeditiously. However, careful oversight will be needed to ensure that any gains made in the near term are not lost over time. That concludes my part of the statement. With your permission, uh, Dan will focus on disability Thank issues. Thank you, Mr. Pendleton. Mr. Pertoni would be anxious to hear from you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here to discuss an issue of critical importance, providing timely, accurate, and consistent disability benefits to returning service members and veterans. Thousands of Ara Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom service members have been wounded in action, many of whom are now trying to navigate a complicated labyrinth of disability policies and often wait many months and even years for a decision. The various commission reports have noted that overhauling the disability evaluation process is key to improving the cumbersome, inconsistent, and confusing bureaucracy facing injured service members. My testimony today draws on our ongoing work and focuses on three areas. Current efforts to improve the, the evaluation process, challenges to reforming the system, and issues to consider as DOD and VA press ahead on this important matter. In summary, our prior work has identified long-standing weaknesses in DOD's and VA's disability programs, especially in regard to the timeliness, accuracy, and consistency of decisions. More recently, an Army Inspector General report noted similar problems with DOD's system, including a failure to meet timeliness standards, poor training, and service member confusion about disability ratings. In response, the Army developed several near-term initiatives to streamline processes and reduce bottlenecks, such as expanding training, reducing the caseloads of staff responsible for helping service members navigate the system, and conducting outreach to educate service members about the process and their rights. To address the more fundamental systemic issues, DOD and VA are also planning to pilot a joint disability evaluation system. The agencies are currently vetting multiple pilot options that incorporate variations of one, a single medical exam, two, a single disability rating performed by VA, and three, a DOD level evaluation board for determining fitness for duty. However, at the time of our review, several key issues remain in question, such as who will conduct the medical exam, how the services will use VA's rating, and determining the role of the board. DOD and VA recently completed a tabletop exercise of four pilot options using actual service member cases. Where preliminary results showed that no single option was ideal, officials told us they were currently analyzing the data to determine which option or combination thereof would be most effective. Although the pilot was originally scheduled for rollout in August 2007, this data slipped as officials continue to consider these important issues, as well as various commission report findings and pending legislation, which could in fact affect the pilot's final design and implementation. Beyond pilot design issues, DOD and VA face other challenges. Three of the options call for VA to conduct the medical exam as well as establish the disability rating. This could have substantial staffing and training implications at a time when VA, with 400,000 pending claims already, 
is struggling to provide current veterans with timely and quality services. We're also concerned that while having a single rating could improve consistency, VA's outdating rating schedule does not reflect changes in the national economy and the capacity of injured service members to work, thus potentially undermining the reintegration of returning warriors into productive society. Going forward, DOD and VA must take aggressive yet deliberate steps to address this issue. Key program design and policy questions should be fully vetted to ensure that any proposed redesign has the best chance of success. This will require a careful, objective study of all proposed options in pending legislation, comprehensive assessment of pilot outcome data, proper metrics to gauge progress of the pilot, and an evaluation process to ensure needed adjustments are made along the way. Failure to properly consider alternatives or address critical policy details could worsen delays and confusion and jeopardize the system's successful transformation. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thanks to both of you gentlemen. Uh, General Schumacher, would you care to make some remarks? Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Shays, uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thanks for this opportunity to update you on the extraordinary and heroic acute care and rehabilitative and comprehensive support of our warriors and families being performed every day at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and throughout our Army. I'm very proud to be here today sharing with you. can't do justice to caregivers at, at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and their colleagues throughout the Joint Medical Force for what they do every day in really extremely demanding jobs. You've seen them yourself when you've been out to visit our hospitals. They're witness to much pain and suffering. The pace is, is, is constant and unyielding. But they recognize that we have the privilege to care for the best patients in the world, our young men and women who have given of themselves for their country. Now, our patients as you've seen, are an astounding group of warriors who inspire and amaze us every day. Their incredible spirit and energy drive our hospitals to the highest level of performance and evoke in our health care providers and staff a level, of, a level of commitment and dedication to patients that's unparalleled in my experience. I'm constantly impressed with the quality and caliber of the health care team at Walter Reed and their unwavering focus on caring for these deserving warriors and their families. I'm awful, always careful to point out to all visitors and to, to members of the public and to our elected officials that the quality of care itself was never in question at Walter Reed or any military facility. As you know, my Command Sergeant Major Althea Dixon and I joined the, the Walter Reed leadership team in early March. In fact, I took command shortly before you. General, may I be rude enough to interrupt you for one second? Would you be kind enough to pull that microphone just a touch closer to you? Some yes, of the sir. members are having difficulty. Thank you. Um, our focus has been on ensuring that the warriors for whom we, ca we care get the very best medical care, the best administrative processing, and the best support services that are available. With robust support from the, Med the Army leadership and a trusted colleague, uh, Brigadier General Mike Tucker, a career armor officer, a former NCO, and, and uh, a, a veteran of both uh, Operation Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom, we have set out to correct identify deficiencies and provide the very best for our warriors and their families. We have received extraordinary support from the United States Army Medical Command, the entire Army, the Senior Department of Defense Leadership, and the Dep Department of Veterans Affairs. During the past six months, we have identified problems and, where appropriate, we have taken immediate corrective actions. Many involve the creation of support services which are present uh, it, w which were present at larger Army installations but weren't available at Walter Reed before the events of mid-February. The, specific of these, the specifics of these changes and the continuing improvements are outlined in my formal written uh, statement for this hearing. Let me focus on several recent events and key people to highlight our progress. First, I would like to talk about Staff Sergeant John D. Shannon. Many of you know Staff Sergeant Shannon is one of the first three soldiers who raised serious concerns about our care and support of soldiers like him. He lived in Building 18. He appeared before this committee at a hearing held in Walter Reed in March. He, he has since met with you and members of your staff, updating you on his concerns and progress. And as uh, you alluded to, Mr. Chairman, he recently was uh, uh, the subject of a newspaper cover story on continuing problems for our warriors in transition like him. I regret that he declined to be with us today. He's uh, in the midst of out-processing, and I trust that he won't take issue with my talking about him in an open hearing here today. 
Uh, we've endeavored to work closely with wounded warriors like Staff Sergeant Shannon to improve our system of care and administrative processes at Walter Reed and by extension across the Army and the Joint Force and into long-term care and continued rehabilitation within the Veterans Administration system. Uh, we immediately improved the housing conditions for all our warriors in transition who are in Building 18 and any other accommodations that did not meet the highest standards of the Army. We created a triad of a squad leader, a, a, a physician a primary care manager and a nurse case manager to ensure the well-being, provide comprehensive medical oversight, uh, and ensure administrative efficiency, timeliness, and thoroughness in the care, and rehabilitation, and adjudication of physical disability for these warriors. Regrettably, in Staff, Sh uh, Staff Sergeant Shannon's case, we encountered a problem toward the end of his very lengthy acute treatment, rehabilitation, and processing of disability, which resulted in misinformation and fear of unnecessary delays in his medical retirement. But his chain of command and the support systems embodied in the triad responded promptly to his call for help, and he underwent all steps on, on schedule in his physical evaluation board process, and he's now out processing from Walt Reed and will be medically retired from the Army. Uh, ironically, uh, Staff Sergeant Shannon, in conversations with him, did not realize that because uh, the physical disability system and the physical evaluation board are separated from our squad leaders that he should not have gone to his squad leader to get help. In fact, that's exactly what we would have asked him to do. And we've helped, we've used his example to re-educate people about how they get help within our system. We truly appreciate his service and his sacrifice. It's our obligation. It's frankly our sworn duty to heal soldiers like Staff Sergeant Shannon. Every warrior in transition and every family is a unique case and experience, experiences unique challenges. We won't perform flawlessly always, but we are hard at work building a team of clinicians, military leaders, and case managers and experts in all aspects of, of medical be uh, de uh, benefits and physical disability adjudication to allow us to provide the very best possible care. Finally, let me talk briefly about efforts to accelerate the transition of Walter Reed into the new Walter Reed National Military Medical Center at Bethesda and how our work on warrior care in the Army is being embraced by the entire joint medical community. Our transition is pre proceeding very well. Rear Admiral Promotable Madison of the Navy, who was recently appointed as the commander of the Joint Task Force to combine medical military operations in the National Capital Region, strongly supports the future establishment of a warrior transition brigade at the future Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda and that may well serve as a model for the development of a joint service approach to caring for warriors in transition. We're also encouraged by recent directions from the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Mr. Gordon England, in an August 29, 2007 memorandum that directs the service secretaries to use all existing authorities to recruit and retain military and civilian personnel necessary to care for seriously injured warriors, and directing the secretaries to fully fund these authorities to achieve this goal. In his memorandum, Secretary England direct, directs the Secretary of Army to develop and implement, quote, a robust recruitment plan, unquote, to address identified gaps in staffing and sufficiently fund the Walter Reed budget to pay for these recruitment and retention incentives. These efforts should help to stabilize the workforce at Walter Reed and to ensure that our warriors will continue to be cared for by the best health care professionals in the world. I believe that the actions that we've taken in the last six months will ultimately make Walter Reed and the Army Medical Department stronger organizations, more adept at caring for warriors and their families. We need to continue to address our shortfalls. We need to continue to focus on serving our warriors and families, and we will continue to improve. Thanks for this opportunity to speak with the committee today and answer your questions. Thank you, General. Uh, Mr. Dominguez. Chairman, um, this on? You need to put that on and pull a little closer if you, could, if you would. It may not be on. There we go. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Shays, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to update you on the progress we've made improving the systems for support and care of our wounded, ill, and injured service members and their families. I apologize for the tardiness of my written testimony, but trust that you will find within it the specific information you need in order to fulfill your oversight responsibilities. I would like to use this opening statement to make four headline points. First, the issue that emerged last February did indeed uncover in our we failed. We acknowledge that failure and the senior leadership of the Defense Department is committed to correcting the system and repairing the 
Secretary Gates has stated that outside of the war itself, he has no higher priority. Next, it is absolutely clear to us that requires a partnership with the Congress, with the various advisory committees, with the nation's many charitable and service organizations, but first and foremost, a partnership with the talented men and women in the Department of Veterans Affairs, Deputy Secretary Mansfield of the VA and Deputy Secretary England of Defense established the Senior Oversight Committee to forge that partnership. At my level, I believe I've spent more time over the last few months with Under Secretary Cooper and Assistant Secretary Dunn than I've spent with members of my own staff. We are jointly and cooperatively working this challenge. Third, we have accomplished a great deal. That is documented in our testimony. We are doing more every day. In fact, only yesterday, the two deputy secretaries endorsed a plan to pilot a substantive revision of the disability evaluation system, which features a single comprehensive physical exam done to VA standards using VA templates and a single rating for each disabling condition with that rating issued by the world-class professionals at DVA and that rating decision being binding on the Department of Defense. Integrating DVA into DOD's administrative decision-making processes is evidence of the extraordinary level of cooperation we have achieved. Fourth, while we have accomplished a great deal, there is still more to do. We will do everything we can within the realm of policy and regulation. Undoubtedly, we will seek legislation, but that legislation would be groundbreaking changing the foundations of our current disability systems and changing fundamentally roles and responsibilities among government agencies. We do not need from the Congress prescriptive legislation addressing the minutia of how we execute our responsibilities within current law. We do need and welcome your oversight of these areas through hearings such as this one and visits such as you conducted earlier this week. And when we have formed our ideas about fundamental changes, we will bring them to the Congress. In the meantime, we are making changes, we're making them fast, and we won't stop until our wounded warriors have the support system they deserve. And thank you, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, I'm gonna break protocol here a little bit because I don't generally do this, but I think my colleagues will share this. I, I hear the tenor in your voice about not wanting Congress to come in with prescriptive legislation. But you have to understand what makes, what makes it tempting for Congress to do that is the utter lack of urgency over a decade that we've sensed from the Department of Defense and other uh, agencies in the government about getting this job done. Nobody that I know of on this panel or anywhere else thinks about doing prescriptive legislation if we don't have to, but we oftentimes think about giving a foot right where it's needed to get things moved. And I'll get into it further in my questioning or whatever, but I'm glad to see that you have a pilot program that you're finally focused on We'll talk about why it took forever to get there, relatively speaking, and things of that nature, and what legislation might be needed. But do understand that nobody here wants to be prescriptive, but the temptation is great when it takes too long a period of time to move from one point to another. And Mr. Shays, you want to add a comment to that? Uh, just to say that that's uh, an opinion shared on both sides of the aisle. Yes, sir. Um, and I, again, I acknowledge we failed, um, and uh, the, uh, fixing the problem is absolutely urgent and absolutely a top priority of our two departments' uh, leadership, and we commit to it, sir. Mr. Dunn, Admiral Dunn. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the recent activities of the Department of Veterans Affairs to serve our nation's veterans through improved processes and greater collaboration with the Department of Defense. Over the past seven months, I have had the privilege of being engaged in many activities dedicated to ensuring our returning heroes from OEF and OIF receive the best available care and services. I join my colleagues from VA and those from DOD in striving to provide a lifetime of world-class care and support for our veterans and their families. On March 6th, the President established the Interagency Task Force on Returning Global, Global War on Terror Heroes. VA Secretary Nicholson was appointed chair 
and I was proud to support him as the Executive Secretary. On April 19th, the task force issued its report to the President. There were 25 recommendations to improve health care, benefits, employment, education, housing, and outreach within existing authority and resource levels. The report was unique in that it also included an ambitious schedule of actions and target dates. Thanks to outstanding interagency cooperation, 56 of 58 action items have been completed or initiated to date. The results are having a positive impact. The Small Business Administration launched the Patriot Express Loan Initiative. This program, which has already provided more than $23 million in loans, provides a full range of lending, business counseling, and procurement programs to veterans and eligible dependents. Other task force-inspired initiatives will support seamless and world-class health care delivery. VA and DOD drafted a joint policy document on co-management and case management of severely injured service members. This will enhance individualized, integrated, interagency support for the wounded, severely injured, or ill service member and his or her family throughout the recovery process. To assist OEF, OIF wounded service members and their families with the transition process, VA hired 100 new transition patient advocates. These men and women, often veterans themselves, work with case managers and clinicians to ensure patients and families can focus on recovery. VA also revised its electronic health care enrollment form to include a selection option for OEF, OIF to ensure proper priority of care. Additionally, a contract was recently awarded for an independent assessment of inpatient electronic health records in VA and DOD. The contract will provide us recommendations for the scope and elements of a joint health record. As you know, many recommendations have been issued lately which center around the treatment of wounded service members and veterans. To ensure the recommendations were properly reviewed and implemented, VA and DOD established the Senior Oversight Committee, which has been discussed this morning, chaired by our two Deputy Secretaries. In a collaborative effort with DOD, VA made great strides in addressing issues surrounding PTSD and TBI across the full continuum of care. The focus has been to create a comprehensive, effective, and individual program dedicated to all aspects of care for our patients and their families. VA and DOD have partnered to develop clinical practice guidelines for PTSD, major depressive disorder, acute psychosis, and substance use disorders. Our Senior Oversight Committee also approved a National Center of Excellence for PTSD and TBI. Since 1992, VA has maintained four specialized TBI centers. In 2005, VA established the Polytrauma System of Care, leveraging and enhancing the expertise at these TBI centers to meet the needs of the seriously injured. The Secretary of Veterans Affairs recently announced the decision to locate a fifth polytrauma center in San Antonio, Texas. VA and DOD are also working closely to redesign the disability evaluation system. As Mike mentioned, a pilot program is being finalized to ensure no service member is disadvantaged by this new system and, th and that the service member receives the high quality medical care and appropriate compensation and benefits. This proposed new system will be much more efficient and I have provided additional details in my written testimony. Over the last four years, VBA has increased outreach and benefits delivery at discharge sites to foster continuity of care between the military and VA systems and speed up VA's processing of applications for compensation. VBA also processes the claims of OEF, OIF veterans on an expedited basis. Collaborating with DOD, we have accomplished a great deal but there is still much more to do. We at VA are committed to strengthening our partnership with DOD to ensure our service members and veterans 
receive the care they have earned? I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Typical of, of this institution, that's a, a message for votes coming up, I assume, uh, on that, and I'll be able to give more information on that in a moment. What I think we'll do at least is start with the questioning uh, and then make a determination. We find out how many votes as to whether we'll have to interrupt or whether we can try to continue on through. I want to thank all of you for your testimony, and uh, despite my interruption, uh, Mr. Dominguez, uh, I think we're trying to be helpful here and, and try to move forward on this basis. And it was something in the tone or the comment that you made that struck a chord there amongst uh, several of us here. But that had to do really with urgency. And you know, one of the things that we, that we constantly uh, have from all of the commissions and from all of our conversations with returning people is the sense that there's been a lack of urgency over time about dealing particularly with the rating system, with the evaluation system on that. And when I look at how long it has taken for the Senior Oversight Committee to stand up and get going on this thing, the frustration is palpable. I was just making a sort of a broad comparison uh, to General Jones's work. He did the Independent Commission on the Security Forces of Iraq. Uh, he got, they started in May of 2007. They assembled teams, 20 prominent retired and active uh, officers, police chiefs, deputaries, secretaries of defenses, et cetera. Uh, they've organized and attend syndicates. They focused on either discrete components or cross-cutting functional areas. They were all subject to review of the full committee. They traveled widely throughout Iraq, which I don't remind anybody is a, uh, a serious, uh, seriously difficult prospect to do in the middle of a war. They interviewed hundreds of Iraqi officials, U.S. officials, visited sites and did all of that and filed their report in four months. We're seven months into this process and what we all admit is one of the major concerns that we have and we're just now getting off the ground. So that's, you know, the lack of urgency, I think, that members coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan sense and the members here on this dais sense. Where have we, why has it taken so long to get going on that? Now, I'll let you answer that in the context of, of the first question I'm going to ask you. Oh, now we've had the pilot program that you announced either yesterday or today, uh, which is good. I'm, I'm glad that that's moving forward. Uh, we need to know from you a little bit more about that pilot program, uh, what it entails, and uh, what it's, you know, does it address GAO's concerns in terms of personnel? Uh, I understand from your, your brief comments that it's going to be the Veterans Administration standards and template on that. So that raises the questions I think that uh, Mr. Pendleton and Mr. Petoni raise about if you choose that, then you have difficulties with uh, the process itself of VA. The single disability evaluation should make it more consistent in disability ratings. Uh, but does it uh, have enough people involved in this system? Are we going to have the personnel? Are we going to take into account the assistive technologies and disabled veterans' ability to work and have a new system for getting people that can be put into work out there? Let's do something about the outdated rating system and all of that. <laughs> does it address that? Uh, and how long is this pilot program going to go? Why aren't we moving immediately into a final disposition of this? If you've done your tabletops, you've had your analysis, you've dealt with the experts, you've looked at the situation, examined the data, uh, how long is this pilot going to go? Why aren't we going right into just getting this done? Uh, and I suspect uh, we'll give you an opportunity to answer that. Um, thank you for the question. First, let me say that I've, if there was anything in my tone uh, that was critical, uh, I apologize for it. Not intended to be. The, um, th the uh, sense of outrage by the Congress and the uh, American people was fully justified. Uh, last spring in the in the demand for urgency fully justified 100% with it. I felt the boot uh, and appropriately applied um, and uh, and and I do want to say that we are uh, moving urgently the SOC meets uh, for an hour a week has been doing that in a decision-making form um, now uh, why we it takes us um, a little longer to get going uh, is that we're doing more than uh, the report. Um, we, in, in crafting our uh, recommendations to the SOC on what we are going to do, um, you know, we have to um, reach down into the organization and get those people who have an equity stake, who have uh, um, a lot of knowledge and experience and, and cause them all to try and work through this and come together. So it's very much um, managing an alliance uh, as we uh, as we work through the issues and come to to grips with it, and then if I remind you of the uh, uh, again the, the comments uh, Mr. Bertoni made, 
about, you know, here's a bunch of the questions that have to be answered and you have to have the evaluation plans and how you're going to do that. And th those are the kinds of, uh, of questions and the due diligence we have to uh, put in place, um, you know, before we can launch on a, prob on, a, uh, on a system. So it does take some time to develop that details, to build that consensus, um, and to work through these uh, issues. I, get, I have to say that the, um, you know, that each of the military services feel an intense need to solve this problem themselves. So when I write in there with Secretary Dunn saying, okay, stand back guys, we're gonna fix this, um, their immediate reaction is, you know, prove it first before we let you, you know, uh, hurt us more. Um, justifiable on their part as well. And so that again is part of the confidence building process that we have to use. Now, um, how this, uh, uh, process will work. Uh, we will use the VA rating. Um, the VA rating for the unfitting condition uh, will be determinative, um, and and the percentage that they uh, put on that will dictate whether a, a first person found to be unfit is separated or retired in the level of benefits, just as in the current system. Um, the pilot we're doing must stay within the context of the current law. Uh, that includes how the VA does their thing with the, with the um, VA schedule rating disabilities. Um, the fact that, that needs to be updated has been acknowledged by the Secretary of VA. I'll let Pat uh, speak to that. Um, but what we're gonna be moving forward with is within the current context of law and what we can do by policy changes and by bringing the VA talent into our side of the administrative processes. And how long do you project the pilot is going to be? Um, sir, we, uh, because this affects uh, people, it's an administrative process that actually, you know, issues an outcome that affects benefits and uh, for real individuals. Um, our first step is we're gonna do um, the next thing beyond a tabletop, which is actually a proof of concept where we walk people who've already been through the system and already been issued um, their benefits and their determinations, we're gonna walk them back through this system and, and see how those two things compare. And then, uh, notionally, uh, January of 08, we'll actually start putting new cases through this. There's also, there's training associated with it and preparation uh, for it. Um, I don't, at present, have a concept for how long that would work. We're, we're gonna do it in the Washington uh, DC uh, metro area uh, first, but if it, if we, within a few months, depending on the number of people that go through it and the outcomes, um, we could very well begin to scale it up uh, across the, the department, excuse me, um, shortly thereafter. Um, when, it, when and if fundamentally different legislation, such as the ideas proposed by Secretary uh, Shalala and Senator Dole come, you know, th then, a lot of things would change uh, based on that. Um, so we'd have to reevaluate how we do that. We'll explore that a little further. I think sure. if we can, my time has expired. Mr. Platts, uh, would you care to ask some questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate you and the ranking member's leadership uh, on, uh, on this issue and the various hearings and visits to Water Reed. I want to thank all of our witnesses, um, both those uh, um, on the front lines of trying to make these systems work, as well as our GAO colleagues and, and their important oversight work. Um, when we uh, conducted our first Excuse hearing- Excuse me, Mr. Platts, I, I hate to do this to you, but there are only six minutes left to vote. Okay. Uh, and I know you want to record your vote, so uh, you have a choice. You can stay and uh, I'll stay with you and we'll both try to make it, or we can go and, and do the quick, two quick votes and be back here in 10 minutes. You want to do that, Mr. Chairman? Fine. We'll, we'll go. We're going to recess. I apologize to our witnesses for the schedule around here, but we'll take 10 minutes probably, uh, Max, and be back here. Uh, thank you.
Secretary, we'll reconvene. I want to thank our witnesses for their indulgence. And Mr. Plass, thank you for allowing us to interrupt. And uh, I think it was a better way to proceed. And hopefully, you'll get your entire five minutes again starting now. Okay. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, just let me re reiterate to our witnesses my thanks to each of you for your efforts on behalf of our wounded warriors. Um, when we had our hearing uh, earlier this year, the first hearing at Water Reed, one of the common messages or, or, or two that I, I want to try to address in my five minutes quickly. Um, one was the care when provided in, in the overwhelming instances was uh, excellent, but the challenge was the coordination of that care either within the DOD system or the transfer to the VA system. Uh, and then the second was the transfer of, of information from DOD to VA. So I'm going to try to address both of those. Um, certainly that's been the focus of the uh, various studies or commissions that have been done um, and uh, specific to the Army with the uh, creation of the uh, warrior transition units. Uh, and then in the broader sense, the SOC has talked about, uh, I think what you're calling recovery coordinators to kind of oversee and be that, that one-stop person for wounded warriors and their family members. Um, my concern is when I, given that that is so critical to these individuals, these soldiers getting to the right entity for their care and not being, as we had heard with Sar Staff Sergeant Shannon and others, kind of left to find their own way. Um, the fact that we are now, you know, more than half a year, I guess, f along the path, and according to the GAO report, about half of these positions are unfilled and even um, a good portion of those that are filled within the Army ranks are temporary and then with the SOC recommendation, it's still just a recommendation. We haven't even begun uh, to uh, implement this process. So I guess if I can start with our, our, our two secretaries first to the broad issue on the, uh, on the recovery coordinators, um, where we stand and, and what's the greatest challenge to getting this up and running um, and to really making a difference. And then, uh, General Schoonmaker, if I could go to you uh, on specific to the Army and the fact that we still have so many vacancies uh, in these very critical positions. I'm sure if I'll, I'll start. Um, um, I think the, the first uh, headline I have to tell you uh, is that the uh, Army uh, has changed the situation on the ground in these hospitals. The, the triad uh, of care that they are deploying through the warrior transition units and stuff, uh, the, the, those that's changing the situation on the ground. That's the necessary and immediate response um, to uh, soldiers in need. Now, uh, is, is that, I know that's the plan, but my understanding, and, and I think from the GAO, is that only 13 of the 38 Army facilities actually have those fu fully staffed, those triad staff. Is that incorrect? Um, uh, I, I can't dispute the GAO uh, data on it I, because this, um, this plan uh, and the triad and the requirement for it <clears throat> um, emerged in the Army's look internally at what they, uh, th what they needed to do. Uh, um, and we have given them at the DOD level every support possible and every uh, encouragement. And in fact, the uh, um, directive that, Sec that uh, General Schoomaker mentioned about, uh, you know, hire everybody you need to hire, use every authority you have to do that in terms of this uh, medical uh, unit. So uh, the situation on the ground uh, has changed where the Army has been able to respond and been able to staff that. So there's, again, it, it, challenges remain, more needs to be done. Um, we're pouring all the gas on it we can. That's also true with regards to the uh, VA DOD collaboration around information sharing and in fact people. There's people from both departments in each other's facilities actually coordinating and managing the transfer of patients uh, when patient and information when patients move back and forth uh, between our systems. Another great example of the partnership stepping up to the challenge and changing the situation on the ground. Um, at, the, at the more global level uh, at the SOC, um, what we're, again, we're trying to do is try and figure out wh why, what else needs to be done globally in uh, this big policy. And, and so, specifically with the recovery coordinators? Oh. Um, uh, that's, yes, sir. That's one of the things that, uh, that we're looking at now is the architecture of roles and responsibilities and how that all works together. Because you don't want to disrupt this triad of care. 
you want to augment it and supplement right. it. So what needs to be done? How do we do that? How do we introduce this new face? What value added does that new face bring? Um, and, and how do you connect them then with the triad of care that's going on? So the, we, we want to move carefully um, but I, I, and deliberately with urgency, absolutely. Um, and uh, I hope to be able to have something definitive within the next uh, few weeks. Uh, about the, how we're sorting through the care recovery coordinator. In fact, part of that discussion will be at the SOC on uh, October 2nd. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could uh, John um, if you if you could respond specific to the triad approach and the, in my understanding from the GAO information, the, the number of vacancies and what do you, your efforts and what do you need from us, if, if anything, to help fill those positions? Uh, yes, sir. I appreciate the, the, the question. Uh, um, first of all, I think Mr. Pendleton made a comment earlier that, that, his, that the findings of the GAO are preliminary and it gives us an opportunity to clarify and to better explain mm -hmm. some, of, uh, some of the data that are, are reported uh, in this very thorough GAO study that we greatly appreciate. Uh, first of all, let me, let me just say real quickly, warriors in transition, who are these people? It's important that you realize that the former terms of med hold, med holdover don't exist any longer within the Army. We have taken all soldiers, uh, active component soldiers and mobilized reserve component soldiers, National Guardsmen and Reservists, regardless of where they became injured, ill, whether they're combat casualties or whether they're, frankly, injured on a training base or develop a, a serious illness in the course of their service, we put them all together in a single unit we call warrior transition units and they are called warriors in transition. The important thing is not where they got injured or ill, is, is simply that they developed an injury or an illness as a consequence of their service and we want to treat them all the same. Uh, we are at this point on, on the projected glide path to fully uh, staff all warrior transition units by the 1st of January. Uh, I, I hesitate to use the word incremental here because it's got a bad, turn, a bad sort of taste in our mouths now. but. We're going as quickly as we can, and the Army has been very, very aggressive about supporting, giving us full staff to provide the oversight of squad leaders, platoon sergeants, first uh, sergeants, company commanders, battalion commanders for these units. Uh, and, and we are on uh, a very good glide path to achieve the goal. Uh, what the GAO heard about and, and does exist is not casualties of war. Every casualty evacuated out of the theater of operation or may any major illness is immediately assigned to a warrior transition unit and is, 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 is given the term, uh, the label of a warrior in transition, and is assigned to a unit that is staffed with a squad leader, platoon sergeant, and you know, a company commander and the like. Uh, what we do have within the Army, however, and have always had, is about an equivalent size, almost brigade sized element distributed throughout our warfighting brigades, divisions, and corps who have a medical illness or an injury that, that renders them at least temporarily uh, unfit or unable to deploy. And we now have a case by case negotiation with their commanders to bring them into the warrior transition unit to, to, to call these, to embrace them as warriors in transition and, and assign them. And that uh, that population is, is, is as yet unstaffed for cadre because we haven't identified which of them. So you, you've them. prioritized those from the combat operations have been prioritized as far as the staffing and now you're moving through the yes, sir, but ranks? If okay. you go to every W2U across the Army right now, uh, we are at over 50 percent cadre supply. At Walter Reed, frankly, we're at 95 percent. And across the Army, we're at about 65 percent across all warrior transition units, and we're on that glide path to be fully staffed. Okay. Thank does you, that, thank does you that Mr. Chairman, for, that? and perhaps I'll have a chance to follow up if we have additional rounds. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to address this uh, question to uh, Undersecretary, Undersecretary Dominguez. Uh, and I, there have been reports about soldiers who, despite physical or mental health problems and against the advice of their doctors, have been ordered to redeploy to Iraq. And we first heard this at our hearing in May 24th. Uh, and since then, we've received additional reports from soldiers at Fort Benning and Fort Carson. Uh, these reports are extremely uh, concerning, uh, disturbing. Do you agree that soldiers who are physically or mental, mentally ill should not be deployed against the wishes of the doctors who are treating them? Uh, absolutely, sir. I understand there may be some gray area 
some soldiers have illnesses that are not severe enough to prevent them from combat duty. Others have mental illnesses that can be successfully treated with medication. In some cases, the soldiers may even want to return to their units. Has DOD have uh, put together a policy that governs these redeployments? How do you balance the needs of the soldiers, the unit, and the military as a whole? Um, sir, we, uh, we've given that uh, a great deal of thought in these last several months uh, that uh, it's partly uh, uh, some of the work of the mental health uh, task force. Um, um, I'll, I'll have to get back to you uh, on the record with the policy that governs this. I do uh, well, I know that they are screened. People are screened yeah. uh, before they redeploy. They're, they're screened um, um, when they come back and then again before they go. And people who have conditions that make them you know, unable or unfit to serve in combat, in a combat theater, um, we have policies and practices in place where they should not be deployed? Well, under the policies, as I understand it, there's supposed to be a unit commander to uh, have to get a waiver from Central Command before they can redeploy somebody. And we have one documented case, uh, at least, from Fort Carson, where a unit commander sought a waiver to redeploy a soldier who was on psychiatrically, psychiatrically limiting medications. Uh, the waiver was denied. And then, despite this denial, the soldier was ordered to redeploy and subjected to disciplinary action when he could not. This seems to me like a clear violation of DOD policy. It was bad for the soldier, unquestionably. It, it, it couldn't have been good for the unit either. If a soldier is not well enough to be in combat, he could present a real danger to his comrades. Can you explain why it appears that DOD policy is not being followed with regard to redeployments of mentally ill soldiers at Fort Carson? Um, no, sir. I, I don't. I'm not familiar with that particular case. I'd. Uh, well, I could you tell us what steps DOD is taking to ensure that the policies are followed? Are unit commanders who do not follow the policy subject to disciplinary action? Um, sir, unit commanders who don't follow DOD policies uh, and uh, uh, yes, are subject to disciplinary action. I know the military is greatly strained. Uh, we have people who have been back in redeployments uh, sometimes um, three or four times. But if we're going to redeploy people, at least we ought to make sure that they're well enough to be in a combat zone. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is there are all, like, also credible reports of um, uh, systemic problems at Fort Carson with regard to wrongful discharges of soldiers with psychiatric conditions. The military comes back and says, well, they have a pre-existing condition, and therefore uh, they, uh, uh, they're not going to take care of them. They don't accept that this is a mental uh, illness problem related to combat. NPR reported on a memo from the director of mental health at Evans Army Community Hospital, and according to reports, this memo was written to help commanders deal with soldiers with emotional problems. Then NPR stated, we can't fix every soldier, and neither can you. Everyone in life beyond babies, the insane, and the demented, mentally retarded, have to be held accountable for what they do in life. And the memo goes on to urge commanders, and I quote, get rid of the dead wood. I, are you familiar with that memo? Uh, no, sir, I'm not. Well, it, it appears this memo is advocating uh, giving uh, uh, up on some of our mentally ill soldiers. It's certainly not a responsible approach. And this business of... Uh, of uh, pre-existing conditions discharge, it means that the soldiers discharged dishonorably and then can't get access to mental health, the care that they require from the Veterans Administration. This certainly doesn't make sense to me. It seems like if a soldier was healthy enough to be accepted into the Army, disciplinary problems that appear to be related to PTSD should not be blamed on pre-existing conditions. These soldiers should receive treatment, not blame. Uh, I'd like to uh, get further reports uh, from you on this issue. It's certainly not appropriate to discharge soldiers with PTSD through this uh, via, via this pre-existing condition discharge. And I'd like to get from you for the record, because my time is up, but I think we need to get this. The DOD policies that prevent soldiers from being inappropriately 
discharge for pre-existing conditions. If this is going on, it's certainly uh, an outrage. I'm happy to provide that. Uh, if, I, if I might, um, I do want to call attention to uh, Secretary Guerin and uh, Chief of Staff General Casey's uh, efforts to train the Army uh, on the challenges of combat stress. Uh, so that very recently they initiated, and if you haven't seen the uh, or heard about the activity they initiated, and General Skumaker can uh, tell you a lot more, uh, a superb effort of leaders uh, to make sure that leaders throughout the Army understand the challenges of combat stress and how to deal with them. I think that was a, it's a laudable, commendable, superb effort by those two. Well, it doesn't seem to be getting through to the leaders at Fort Carson, so I think we need further reports on whether the Army is actually getting educated or whether more paper is just being generated. Happy to do that, sir. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. And Mr. Dominguez, then we'll expect some report back on those particular incidents uh, that uh, Chairman Waxman uh, discussed in a reasonable time. We would appreciate that. Uh, yes, sir. Happy to do that. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank you again for all the work that, that you have done on this issue, um, both when the uh, original issues came to light of, of the care um, that uh, our, our soldiers were receiving. And um, your, your efforts on this committee have not only made a big difference, but have highlighted some solutions that, that we've been hearing today. Uh, I serve on uh, the Armed Services Committee and the VA Committee and on this subcommittee. So I get three bites to the apple on, on this issue many times. Um, I was very proud to, to uh, listen to Senator Dole and Secretary Shalala deliver uh, their recommendations to the VA committee uh, and, and like many are very appreciative of their work as they have looked to some real solutions and identifying uh, real problems. Uh, I want to echo the comments that, that others have made about the medical evaluation board processes of DOD and, and the VA and the recommendations from Secretary Dole and I mean, Secretary Shalala and Senator Dole on the um, problems of the, the time for the process, the inconsistencies and the lack of coordination between DOD and VA, and I think they've got some, some great recommendations. Um, so many times we look at streamlining processes instead of, as, as they have, have recommended, um, uh, collapsing processes and making them thereby more, more, uh, more efficient. Uh, but in, in looking at the three different committees that, that, that I serve on and the information that we receive and how we need to proceed, one of the things that, that this committee has continued to hear uh, in this process that are of, a, of great concern is um, a, a sense between uh, reserve components, guard, and, um, and active uh, members that there's a disparity perhaps for reserve and, and guard uh, members and the, the level of, of their care, the facilities, uh, the resources that are brought to bear to, to assist them. Um, they've told the committee that uh, you know, at times they feel like they're, they're second class citizens and um, I know that each of you have an, a concern and a dedication to that issue, and I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond to uh, the feelings of disparity that they have, uh, the issues that you do see where there are disparities and ways in which it might be addressed or that ways in which you actively are, are looking to address it. We'll start with General. You want to start with me, sir? Please. Um, well, sir, I, I would say, uh, right off the bat, I think that their perceptions are real and um, uh, they were certainly justified. Um, I think many, one of the, one of the failures that was alluded to by uh, Mr. Dominguez earlier uh, of the Department of Defense is, and in, in the Army we were, we were guilty of the same, is that we, we put in place some structural solutions um, uh, shortly after the first deployments of our reserve component uh, colleagues. We mobilized National Guard and Reserve uh, elements, and when they returned or when they were, were injured or showed up at our deployment platforms with uh, illnesses, uh, we segregated them into two different populations, med hold for active component soldiers and med holdover units for the reserve component soldiers. Now that was done because uh, there are differences between the two com comp components when it comes to uh, uh, processing of uh, disability and uh, outprocessing the Army and the like, uh, things that are more arcane from, than, 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 than this general can understand, fr quite frankly. But I think what that did, unfortunately, was create the impression on both sides, ironically, both the active component and the, and the mobilized reserve component soldiers, that they were being treated differently. 
And one of the, I think, successes that we're that we've seen, and we're certainly we will continue to, to work on this misperception of the two, of the two groups by creating a warrior transition unit in a single term to to apply to to all soldiers. They're, they're all active duty soldiers. They've whether they are come out of the reserve component or they, they're active component soldiers like myself. They are all active duty soldiers that are serving the nation, and frankly, they're carrying a heavy load. And so we're trying in every way we can to break down that misperception. General, I appreciate your commitment to that. Uh, it is an important issue, and I, I know that, that everyone agrees with you on it. It need um, for your, yours and others' success. Anyone else would like to comment on, on the issue of things we need to look at or that are? Sure, if I, uh, I might. Um, we, we uh, yeah, I, I believe the Army has changed the situation on the ground in the military treatment facilities at Army installations. We have a continuing challenge uh, when we get uh, reserve uh, and guardsmen home uh, as they want to do fast and then they may have uh, trauma and challenges, particularly the PTSD and the TBI, which sometimes emerge late. Um, uh, you know, after they've been demobilized back into their civilian communities, we have challenges trying to devise and deliver programs to help them with the tough, tough challenge of reintegration. Uh, because they're distributed all over the place. They're not concentrated at a military facility where we can get to them. Um, we are working through those uh, challenges. Several um, activities right now underway on, in terms of reintegration. Uh, lots of work thinking through with the VA how to reach those people in their communities at home and make sure they get uh, care when they're back home. Um, and lots of opportunity through TRICARE and the TRICARE um, uh, delivery organizations to, uh, to make sure that they get uh, uh, treated. But it, it is a challenge when we get them back home, um, making sure they get the care and support they need. Sir, if I might also comment, uh, in Secretary Nicholson's task force, we also discovered that uh, with the Guard and Reserve in the when they would go home and then try to do the post-deployment uh, uh, health reassessment, uh, we found that it would be helpful if the local VA medical center was represented at those sessions. And so we, as a result of the task force, we've taken that action to get from DOD the schedule of when those reassessments are taking place. And then we task the uh, closest medical center to support those, those events and have uh, VA uh, experts uh, available at those sessions. So we are are aware of uh, potential problems, uh, Guard and Reserve, and we're uh, working hard to try to find solutions to the process uh, to alleviate those. Let me add one additional uh, comment to what my earlier comments. When we have looked very carefully at one of the critical steps in, uh, uh, in adjudication of disability for both reserve component and active component soldiers, you need to understand, Congressman, we have not found any systemic uh, evidence that the two are treated differently at that level. I think much of what you are describing is a perception at our, at our, at our uh, facilities, our fixed facilities. What Mr. Dominguez said and uh, uh, the Admiral said is exactly right. When they get back out to their communities, it is very hard for us to reach out and touch them, and we are working very actively to try to find the resources necessary to extend that care. But certainly at the point of separation and the adjudication of disability, uh, reserve component soldiers sit on the boards that adjudicate their disability, and uh, we have found no evidence in looking back uh, at, at those adjudications that there is any systemic bias. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Uh, excuse me. Can I offer up uh, just a quick observation? Uh, last year we actually did a study for the Armed Services Committee where we were asked to look at disparities in the rating system for reservists and active duty. We did a, a very sophisticated analysis of, of, of outcomes, and, and it's true we couldn't find a real disparity between the ratings level uh, between Army uh, active uh, service members and, and reservists. But we did find that the reservists were less likely to receive uh, re disability retirement benefits and, as well as lump sum benefits. And we, the data was insufficient for us to determine the reasons for that. It just, it just wasn't available. We think a couple things were going on. Uh, I think one of the things was the eight-year pre-existing condition rule. Um, a reservist entering the service in 1985, uh, fulfilling all the obligations of, of his commitment or, or her commitment, 
going on a one-year tour of Iraq and Afghanistan, by 2005, that person would only have 6.9 years of credible service and would fall within the eight-year pre-existing condition rule, so certainly a factor. Um, uh, and generally, time and service would, would come into play also. If they didn't have the 20 years, they certainly wouldn't get the 20 years in that period of time based on reserve status. And I testified before the Dole Shalala Commission on this issue and uh, brought forth a couple of points. That were, there were 26,000 service members assessed through DOD system in 06 or 05. One in four of those was a reservist. So not only do we have more reservists making up a larger share of our, of our, our military force, but we also have um, more reservists uh, coming in to f and seeking disability services. So I think we really need to look as a, as a, as a, as a, um, um, at our policies uh, currently and whether they're serving the reservists. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Turner. Mr. Chairman. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for um, uh, the, the follow-up you've been doing um, on, this, on this issue because quite often it uh, comes to light and then there's a lot of uh, excitement and um, people are making plans and then no one follows up to make sure the plans actually are implemented. So thank you so much for the hearing and I thank the gentlemen here today for their testimony. Um, I'm not a stranger to the VA system. My father was a disabled vet. Um, I'm a regular fixture quite often at our VA uh, facility in, in Minneapolis. And I would like to uh, commend the work that I've seen done in the polytrauma units, the lessons learned from the rollouts as, it, as the units have gone through, the video linking um, with the families being present, uh, uh, the doctors uh, speaking to one another uh, w with the patients and, and that. So there's been a lot of work done in there because basically you were starting from ground zero so you could kind of invent the platform that you wanted to work off of a little bit in there using uh, updated technology. But that's not necessarily the case you see um, in the other parts of the, the VA system. One uh, area, even in the polytrauma unit that I'm concerned about is the uh, Department of Defense person that's assigned there to kind of make sure that the flow of the paperwork goes forward. Most of that time, the person's there for three months. It's not a career maker to be assigned to that, that unit. And so um, there even might be uh, uh, people who uh, look at this as uh, something that if they can get transferred out of quickly that they, that they can. I think that um, service in that unit has a lot uh, to offer um, for families in that. The Marines, however, have decided to make this a priority and the Marines I've spoken with at, at, uh, at our facility in Minneapolis, they're planning on being there for a year. Uh, my comments um, now kind of shift more to GAO. One of the things that we heard um, Mr. Dominguez say is as we go through with the disability rating, DOD is looking at moving forward with uh, the VA disability rating. And I turn my attention to page 17 of the GAO report. Um, and there's two things on there I would like um, to have um, you comment on. One is the lack of confidence that our servicemen and women often have in the disability um, rating system, both in uh, DOD and, uh, and possibly DA, uh, VA. And secondly is uh, the uh, way in which the VA's rating system needs to be updated to reflect to what's currently going on in today's labor market. And maybe if you could even um, comment, uh, I had uh, many uh, people I worked with, case work with uh, uh, airline mechanics who received shoulder injuries, arm injuries. They were very concerned about their ability to turn back to work and return back to work at a, at a level which would allow them to move forward. The other um, issue I would like to see um, addressed and DOD on VA ha keeps talking about their plans. You folks did the study. I haven't seen any budgets on how these plans are going to be implemented. I mean, we need to know, I serve on the Appropriations Committee, we need to know what we should be setting aside to appropriate to make these plans become a reality, both in uh, the transfer of technology um, and uh, what, uh, what this is going to mean to um, staffing personnel. And Mr. Chair, I 
buzzer has gone off, but I would just also like to bring to the Chair's um, um, attention. Uh, there is concern that traumatic brain injuries might lead to epilepsy for some of our service uh, men and women later on in life, and my understanding is the VA's uh, uh, where they are on working with NIH to make sure that this uh, is addressed and is not considered a preexisting condition, and we ignore that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Cullum. Um, Mr. Lynch, do you have any objection? Mr. Hose apparently has another meeting to go to and is asked to ask some questions before he leaves. Does that fit with your schedule or do you also have a place to go? Well, we have, we have, we have, we have, folks, we have time floor, for two so people to question before we go. I'm sorry? We have both Mr. Hodes and you will be able to get your questions in before we go. Yeah, I have no problem. Great. Mr. Hodes, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you for holding these hearings. Um, as you are all aware, uh, these matters first came to prominence with um, articles about substandard care at Walter Reed um, uh, that appeared in the Washington Post. Um, and among uh, the results of the articles and initial hearings were, um, was the testimony by Sergeant Shannon, who had lost an eye, suffered head trauma, and testified about languishing at Walter Reed for two years. And he talked about the difficulties he would had. Now, here we are in September uh, with all the attention that has been paid, and uh, we met Sergeant Shannon on Monday. He is back in the newspapers again. Um, there is an article about uh, his having lost, about the, his retirement papers having been lost, um, and he is now going to have to wait until December or January before he can retire. The subcommittee went to Walter Reed on Monday, and um, uh, we thank uh, you, General Schoonmaker, for um, briefing us and for uh, telling us about your efforts. We had the opportunity to meet with a large group of soldiers um, in, a, in a room without brass. And we heard horror stories from them. Uh, they told of case managers who were unqualified, um, not doing their job, not up to the task. They told us of delays in pay, of or, or uh, not receiving the awards due to them for their service to the country. They told about languishing, continuing to languish at Walter Reed for months or years. They told about continuing problems with scheduling um, medical appointments so that they were basically jerked back and forth about their scheduling. One soldier said to us sarcastically, and I quote, that Walter Reed was the best place I've ever been incarcerated. When we asked them whether they'd prefer to go back to Iraq or uh, be in Walter Reed, nearly all of them said they wanted to go back to Iraq. Um, I have a constituent who turned to me to help him because he's been experiencing the same kind of thing on an ongoing basis. And I've been uh, a advocating for him within the system. He had to turn to his congressman to advocate for him within this system. Um, the Army apparently will agree that Walter Reed's problems are a microcosm of those found throughout the, uh, f found throughout the Army. I would like to know, first, why are these horror stories still continuing uh, as of our visit on Monday, number one? Number two, I uh, will then, I would like to move on to questions about the case management system. But why, why are we still hearing this? Well, I think that's a difficult question. I, I, you met with 31 or 34 soldiers, I believe, on, on Monday when you went, and um, a selection, um, a self-selected group of soldiers in large measure who wanted to talk to you. Uh, I, uh, we have 680 soldiers in that category right now at Walter Reed, and so you're seeing a subset of the whole population. I, I would venture to say that every one of the soldiers you had that you saw has an individual case with an individual set of family or personal problems that we have to work through each and every one of. This is a difficult mm. time for in the lives of all of these soldiers. We, we acknowledge the fact that we start off uh, with, in a difficult position with, with them trying to, to establish trust and, and a relationship. They have gone into the Army or they in some cases have gone overseas and have come back not the same people that they went. And uh, we started at a disadvantage. We, we try to rebuild that relationship, but we, we aren't always successful in overcoming all of the problems these soldiers face. Um, all I can tell you, uh, Congressman, is if you give me details about each and every one of them, uh, we can address them through the, 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 the devices that we have, acknowledging that uh, we continue to 
seek solutions to this single adjudication process that has already been alluded to by, you know, our leaders within the, the DOD and the VA. That, that still represents, and it represented for, for Sergeant Sandin, one of his, his uh, hot button, button points as they approach the final adjudication of their disability. It, it, it elicits enormous anxiety and resentment about their service and how we are treating them and how we as a nation are, uh, see their service. But if you give me details about any of those horror stories, uh, sir, I, would, I will personally take them on. Is it your testimony that the uh, soldiers who we visited with on Monday uh, are not representative of the uh, active duty uh, outpatient population at Walter Reed now? Uh, yes, sir, I'd, I'd have to say that's true. Um, you, I was placed in that position to solve uh, the problems of Walter Reed. And if at the end of this period of time, uh, with all the efforts that we put into it, if all of the soldiers at Walter Reed are characterized by what you just des described, I would say that I've been a failure as a commander and I'd be, I should be held accountable. Uh, this is not the general rule. Uh, I can't say that every soldier is ha happy with what's going on in their lives. As I explained before, we they start with, with, at a disadvantage. Uh, they, they've come back ill or injured. Um, they're going back into communities, some of them not unable to resume their employment. But no, sir, I would, I would, I would not say that this characterizes the, the rule for our soldiers. Uh, I see Thank my you. time is up. And, and the only comment I'd make, General, is I appreciate the task that you have undertaken in trying to reform the way things are done. But I suggest to you that if there is one horror story at Walter Reed, then there is room for accountability. And it should not be up to Congress to tell you who's having problems, but for you and your staff and the case managers to find out who's having problems and address them as quickly and completely as possible. Thank you, General. Roger. Thank you, Mr. Hodes. Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the panelists uh, for, for attending as well, helping the committee with its work. Uh, I have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, they are related. Uh, as previously noted by the GAO in its March uh, 31, 2006 report, the Department of Defense grants each of the branches of the service considerable discretion in how it evaluates disability. Uh, and uh, that's with one, respect to a determination of whether the service member is fit to return to duty, and secondly, with respect to the assignment of disability ratings. And uh, specifically, each branch of the armed services manages its own physical disability evaluation system, which includes the MEB, the Medical Evaluation Board, and the PEB, uh, the Physical Evaluation Board. I asked uh, the Department of Defense to, to send me the numbers on, on how each branch of the service uh, handles uh, these evaluations for disability. And I was surprised. Well, maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was. Uh, when you take the Navy's numbers, and those include the Marines, uh, they basically uh, have a determination rate of about 35 percent, either either totally or, or, or temporarily disabled, 35 percent for the Navy. Uh, the Air Force has, has about 24 percent. And, uh, and the, the, the figure that really stood out to me was the Army. Uh, the Army has about 50 percent of all of the disability claims before it, and it approves only 4 percent, 4 percent compared to the other branches for, for permanent and, and, and then 15 percent for temporary disability. And now I hear today uh, from, Mr. from Mr. Dominguez that, that we're going to merge the standards uh, of the DOD with that of the VA. And uh, I, I think it was Mr. Bertoni who said earlier today, uh, the VA has 400,000 uh, case backlog. And uh, I know from my own personal experience dealing with my veterans back home, uh, in the 9th Congressional District of Massachusetts that I have typically an eight-month waiting period before one of my vets can go see a doc, a vet, you know, a VA doctor. And uh, that, that, that just has a, I'm afraid of that. 
you merge two systems, and uh, I associate myself with the remarks of, of Mr. Hodes earlier. Uh, we met with 30 to 35 uh, soldiers at, at Walter Reed on Monday who were very, very unhappy. And, and the chief complaint, if I could generalize, uh, was the, the mind-numbing bureaucracy that they have to deal with in getting treated with dignity and respect and having their cases resolved. Uh, it varied. Some felt they shouldn't be there. They were fine, and they wanted to go back with their units. They wanted to go back as war fighters. Others uh, were being held for, for other uh, more extensive injuries. There were some amputees who, who certainly, uh, certainly needed to be there, and, and, uh, but, but also needed to have their, their cases uh, dealt with in a, in a more expeditious manner. And uh, given the different standards here, you've got, a, you've got a military DOD system that evaluates a soldier based on their fitness for duty, given their rank and their, their responsibility. You've got a, that's the DOD standard. The VA system is looking at their employability as a civilian, and they're, they're basing their, their, uh, their disability evaluation on that standard. When you merge these two, uh, I'm afraid you're going to discount the, the first Defense Department disability based on their, their actual injuries, and you're going you're gonna to moderate that because you're going to find some type of employability on the other end. I'm just uh, very concerned about the merger of these standards. I, I, I want our war fighters to, to be treated with uh, the dignity and the respect that they deserve, but I, I have to raise uh, a fair amount of caution here because of the two standards. How, how, let me throw it out to all of you. How do we, how do we basically, number one, eliminate the, the, uh, the disparity between the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force, and the Army, and then at the same time reconcile the differences between the two standards, one a civilian standard and one a military standard, in uh, evaluating these disabilities. Mr. Lynch, if I can interrupt for a second. I'm, I'm going to give an option to you to pick one and ask him to answer in 30 seconds. You have three minutes to vote. Uh, so our, we'll come back and you'll be the first to address when we come back. Uh, okay, you can pick the that. first one. Uh, what's that? You want to take the Oh, break? we can come back? We're going to come back anyway. Why don't we come back? All right. Thank you all very much. Another 10 minute interruption for votes, and we'll see if we can get there in three minutes or not. Thank you. Thank you. We'll reconvene the meeting again. Again, I apologize for the floor schedule that keeps moving us off. I, we will finish up on this round, uh, no matter what happens on that, I assure you. Uh, Mr. Lynch had posed a question just before we left, and if anybody would care to address that question, I would be happy to entertain that. Mr. Dominguez. Would you like me to restate it? No, thank you, Mr. Lynch. <laughs> <Five other questions. laughs> Mr. Dominguez, go ahead. Uh, sir, let me uh, uh, first address the, how this uh, new process will, will work. Um, the first is that there will be a single comprehensive medical exam and it will be done to uh, standards and using a template that the VA provides um, so that we can make sure we document the medical condition, each and every medical condition in, in it so it's documented medically. So if there's a, um, an issue with a, a joint, then the circumstances around it and the degree of flexion of the joint and those kind of things are all documented uh, so that the downstream actions can all be taken informed by that. 
that exam goes will go to a PEB, a uh, personnel evaluation board, which is of uh, military uh, members who will use that information and look at the medical conditions and bump that against the standards for performance of a job within a unique individual service and within a skill and in a grade and specialty. And so the decisions then are being made based on a medical description against a service specified standards for this individual to do his or her job. <clears throat> Once that uh, evaluation board determines that the individual is unfit and will likely have to leave the service, um, the, all that, that case file is then forwarded to the DVA rating examiners. It's only at that point that a rating is associated with uh, the condition. That comes back to DOD for one decision only, which is that how are you separated or retired? Um, so that's how we would use it in, in our process. Uh, and of course, the, the uh, current law provides the um, degree of uh, retirement pay you're entitled to is, a, is also a function of the, um, the degree of the disability above 30%. 30% you're retired, you know, above that it, um, it uh, affects how much you're paid in your DOD retirement annuity. Um, of course, you have all the appeal rights, et cetera, but, but that's how we would use it. So we're using medical information to make this military determination. And that determination is uh, different by each service because uh, each service standards for what's required to do the job is, is different and unique. Um, you can be an airman with an injured back, but not an infantryman because you wouldn't be able to carry the rucksack, for example. I hope that answered your question, sir. Mr. Keller, do you want to ask Mr. Lynch to yield? Uh, yes. Mr. Lynch, would you yield? I would. Uh, yes. Um, explain to me how, that, how the National Guard gets figured into that, which was my, part of my questions that I had asked earlier. I'm, an, uh, I'm a, a highly uh, trained uh, airplane mechanic. I'm called up, active duty. Let's say the, my, my shoulder uh, is... Uh, destroyed. I can't go back to work as an airline mechanic anymore. What do you do for that individual? Uh, Ma'am, there's uh, was two parts to the question. Um, assuming you're a National Guardsman um, airline or a airplane mechanic in the Guard and we found your, con your condition unfitting um, and determined that you needed to be retired, uh, just like any member of the armed forces, you would then be retired by the uh, disability uh, board. You'd be uh, given a retirement annuity based on the, the level of disability in the pilot, again, assigned by a DVA rating panel. Then when you, uh, by that time, the VA will already have your records. They will already determine the degree of disability. Um, and uh, and you would Excuse be then me, compensated Mr. that Chair, way. I'm not talking about somebody who was an airline mechanic and that was part of their job in the National Guard because we have people who are DOD employees who do an excellent job of maintaining aircraft to St. Paul, Minneapolis and Holman Field in St. Paul. Not talking about those. I'm talking about the gentleman who was called up for active duty who works for Northwest Airlines and can't go back to work. What do you do for that individual? Once they are um, retired from the DOD, um, they then go to the DVA, and it's Admiral Dunn's challenge at that point. Nice hand up, Mr. Dominguez. I got to hand it to you. That was good. <laughs> when the uh, when the claim is filed and uh, medical condition is evaluated in accordance with the VA templates, uh, not only the shoulder but any other condition which the veteran identifies and we have a medical evaluation of is taken to the rating schedule 
and based on the rating schedule, the disabil disability percentages are applied for that veteran for every item that they claim. Thank you. Mr. Shays. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman, again for doing this hearing. And um, uh, I am somewhat conflicted by uh, the challenge that you have to face, General, and the others. When we came and met on Monday, I felt that I was meeting with a representative group of traumatic brain injury uh, soldiers uh, and others dealing with some very real, as they said, mental issues. Uh, I didn't feel we were dealing with some of the other physical challenges. So in, to that extent, I do agree it's not representative. But it is representative, it seems to me, of those who are dealing with brain injuries and so on. On one side, we had a group that was complaining that they weren't being discharged. Charged. And on the other side, we had people who were afraid that someone might say something was wrong with them and they couldn't go back in uh, to the service. So I felt, uh, I was trying to put myself in the position of a doctor. If you believe that some are there to try to, because they're soldiers, Marines, and others, and they want to go back, but they may not be well enough to go back, I'm struck with the fact that as a, as a, as a physician, you've got a difficult task. You've got to try to see who's not qualified to go back and who, who needs to be discharged, and neither side may like your outcome. Now, the one thing that, that I was struck with, though, well, there was one physician uh, in particular, one doctor, that almost everyone there, who anyone who came in contact with, no one defended him, uh, that uh, he was disrespectful, biased against guards and reservists, and, and some said incompetent. Um, we have heard complaints about this doctor by others because our staff does extensive work. Um, evidently, he seems to be a key player, and I have a feeling, uh, General, that you may know which one this is because there is one who clearly gets a lot of complaints. Without discussing the individual, uh, what, is, what is the argument that he still is there? Well, first of all, I, uh, let me just make, make it very clear. The two, two points you've made, and I think they're very good ones. Um, virtually every soldier I've ever met in a, in a military hospital, um, even our amputees, under the most desperate circumstances, wants to go back to war, wants to go back where their colleagues are. It's heartbreaking to have to tell people that they cannot serve in the capacity that they came into the, into the service, especially when they're leaving an active theater of war. Um, and it is very difficult to work with patients who have a variety of, of di disabilities and problems that are going to keep them out of that. Frankly, it, that doesn't fall to the physician or the medical community in, in general. It falls to the line commander who is part of that equation. Who makes that? So it is difficult. I'm just going to interject myself, but when you hear of people being there for a year, 18 months, you begin to think there clearly is some breakdowns there. I'm just going to say parenthetically. Well, but sir, I, just, I, I mean, again, uh, uh, every time I, I'm very careful about not making generalizations because, as I've said in many in many four, that every patient, every family is different. One of our heroes. Uh, retired General Freddie Franks, uh, Fred Franks, who came back from Vietnam and ultimately lost a portion of his his leg, uh, was 21 months in an Army convalescing hospital at Valley Forge, and returned to duty. He ended his service as a four-star general. He was the Corps commander that took the Seventh Corps in the first Gulf War into into Iraq. So, uh, every time I'm given a timeline to hold a soldier to, I'm always pointing out that that's not fair. What about this doctor? Uh, the doctor in question, uh, his, his care has been looked at very carefully by other uh, physicians in his practice, and his care, objectively, is, is, is always been determined to be uh, appropriate. Uh, what I was led to believe was that he was taken out of the front line of caring for these patients, and, I, and I'll have to go back, sir, and just confirm whether they're talking about prior events and encounters with him, because what we've moved toward very, very 
firmly at Walter Reed and across the Army are dedicated, uh, in a sense, um, institutionalized uh, MEB doctors, Medical Evaluation Board's doctors, whose specialty, in a sense, is to take care of the Medical Evaluation Board. But I, I will take that question and get back to you for the record. Let me ask, I, I see a yellow light, but let me ask this. In regards to the Board, there seem to be tremendous fear on the Board. And is that simply because the Board in basically plays God on what happens to these individuals? Are you talking about the Physical Evaluation Board, sir? Yeah. Yes, sir. I think, I think for the average soldier, and this is especially true, Ms. McCollum, I think, hit a, hit a very important point out here. I mean, these the soldiers come in, they're declared unfitting for the service that they, and for the role that they play in the service, but they go back into other civilian roles. And they can't go back, maybe they come in and serve as an infantryman, but they're going to go back and walk a beat as a, as a policeman or woman. And, and what they face is, what's going to be life for me now and my family? Uh, we know that there's a, th they know that there's a threshold of 30 percent disability. 30 percent disability renders them eligible for TRICARE health care benefits for themselves and for their family. Everybody knows within my hospital and everybody within the medical evaluation board system knows about the 30 percent. But if the unfitting condition that, that renders you unfit to serve in whatever capacity you are, it only gives you 10 or 20 percent. And, that, and by, by policy and by law, as I understand it, we're limited to that. Even if the VA later adjudicates all of the associated injuries or illnesses as giving them more than 30 percent, we're held to the unfitting condition. And so they may be separated with a, a single lump uh, payment uh, and not uh, health care benefits for their entire family that they would if they reached the 30 percent disability rating. So I think that's going to remain a hot button item under any disability evaluation system that we have, and that's got to be well, just resolved. Just uh, any comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, that did come up continually about their health benefits. Their health benefits almost seemed more important than any financial benefit they get, and it would be maybe behoove us to look at, uh, at that issue and see what kind of flexibility could, could take place. Thank you, Mr. Shays. And, and it was a point that came up again and again. Um, and that adversarial nature is, is what results from that. I mean, they, and I think that we're going to look at, at that as part of it, look and see whether or not on the other end coming out, whether something can be done in the health care and work on that. Is there any member of the panel that uh, would like to ask a, a, another question that uh, feels some business has gone unfinished from their perspective? Yeah. Would you use the microphone, please? I, I can't hear you. I was, are they going to ask the, answer the questions that I asked before you started collectively gathering the questions? Um, if you have another question you want to ask or you don't feel it was responded, you can ask it here if you like. They didn't have an opportunity. Well, go um, ahead and ask. Do you have the notes from when the votes were going off and I was asking my question? Great. Thank you. Take the, I think there was a, you might have to recap those. I heard a lot of things. Um, I had asked uh, about uh, uh, refreshing the VA's um, disability uh, standards, the distrust that kind of exists between uh, the servicemen and women with the disability rating board, and I think that, that came forward. Because most people get turned down the first time. It's been my experience with, with, uh, with uh, uh, quite often and they're going through an appellate process and it's long and it's cumbersome, so you'd made some suggestions on that. And then the other uh, question I had to kind of capsulize it so we, so we can wrap up is all of these plans and programs that have been put in place at the hospitals for the polytrauma unit, for having the caseworker be there, uh, and I'm probably using the wrong term now, the, the, the Department of Defense person there to help with the paperwork and to move things forward being there longer than three months, the budget being built in for all these new per, uh, uh, people that are being added as, as caseworkers, the money that's going to be needed to update these systems so that they are workable for transferable for records and make it seamless for the soldier, their families, and the doctors involved. I haven't seen a budget for that. Seen plans, lots of ideas, things being you know, painfully implemented in a slow process. But this Congress needs to have a budget so that we do it right, because I'm assuming 
that the Department of Defense or the VA can't take this quote unquote all out of hide. These are big price tag at, uh, items and I'm on the Appropriations Committee and to the best of my knowledge, um, I haven't seen a budget for them. And I, so I was asking uh, for the gentleman here who conducted the, uh, the review to uh, let me know what they thought about that. Um, we haven't seen the budget figures either. We ask, our understanding is that the cost of, the incremental cost will be included as part of the President's budget. That is one of the initiatives of the Senior Oversight Committee and you have representatives here. We, we have outstanding requests for that, but we honestly at this point don't know. Mr. Chair, um, can I ask DOD and VA? Um, it's, it's, it's been ongoing. It's been 10 years since you've been going to integrate your records. Certainly you have a budget someplace that uh, we can look at and look at today. Do you not? Um, the, uh, uh, the budget that is, supports the integration uh, and, the, and the sharing of information in the medical uh, organizations uh, is funded. It is part of the budget that was submitted in 08. It's in the TRICARE uh, piece of the budget. We can, uh, I'll get back to uh, Dr. Cassell's. Uh, we can try and pull that out uh, for you for the record. There will be certainly in the 09 President's budget submission uh, changes to that because we will be accelerating um, those uh, activities. In the, in the case of uh, uh, the standing up to warrior transition units and those kind of staffing and that and, and those issues um, because th that happened in 08 um, the DOD and the services took that out of hide in in terms of reprogramming in in 08 uh, there may have been something in the supplemental that that helped us in fact uh, the Congress appropriated a huge amount for TBI and PTSD for which we are deeply grateful which really did accelerate a lot of uh, of the thinking and the activity and our ability to respond uh, to those crises. Uh, but the 08 or the 09 uh, submission of the President's budget, this we will make sure that these uh, activities are called out to your attention um, um, when, when the President submits that budget to you. Mr. Chair, could I ask GAO then why weren't you able to be, the yellow light when, when, you, when you asked your question, why weren't you able to get the budget numbers? I, I was referring to future estimates for the new initiatives. I, I don't know that they've been created uh, yet. Um. The, Thank you. Mike. I think he's responded. Thank you. Mr. Shays, you have a couple of final questions. And, uh, first off, the GAO has, has really pointed out that DOD and the VA have been trying to work for 10 years to integrate and, and to um, to, to share information and there's got to be a point where there's going to be some success here and the only thing that I can conclude is it's just simply not a high priority. Uh, I'd like to ask Geo two questions. What do you believe are the greatest challenges to the implementation of each of the recommendations of the Dole Shalala report? But just and by each of them, let me just give me some of the highlights because we'd be here very long. So what do you think are going to be, are the greatest challenges to the implementation of these recommendations? Of the Dole Shalala report? Yep. Um, in, in hearing the uh, VA testimony, I, I sort of, I took down some notes. It looks as though they've, they've gone with a single comprehensive exam, done the VA standards using VA templates. So that, that is, uh, we call that the Dole Shalala light option in, of the four that we looked at. Um, all the other options had um, VA doing the exam as well as the, the rating. So it looks like they're moving toward the, the Dole Shalala portions that don't have to be addressed in legislation, which is a single exam and a single rating. Um, I think folks on both sides agree um, that th that's probably the way to go, to have the single exam and have the single rating. I think in terms of the, the, the two bureaucracies, um, I think there might be some pushback or concern as to um, who should actually have it in the end. So, I mean, change management is going, going to be difficult. I think you need some management support at the top. You need a plan. You need change agents within the agency to sort of convey to the, the troops, the, the bureaucrats, that we're moving in this, this direction. And you need some early wins. And if they go in this direction, they implement the pilot, 
if they could show that they have uh, uh, substantially decreased time frames, that's some early wins that can gain momentum. So I, that, that's, that can help. I'm concerned that they aren't paying, they may not be in, paying enough attention to accuracy and consistency, sort of the three-pronged um, issues that we've identified. If um, the system is not viewed as being accurate and consistent, we're back to uh, service member distrust, congressional oversight, all these things that brought us here today. So that's certainly a, uh, an issue. Generally getting in front of the implementation before considering all of the unanswered questions um, is uh, of concern to us. Um, we would be interested in seeing how they arrived at, at this decision, the data that drove that decision. Um, in, in, our, in our view, it should be based on, an, it should be a data-driven decision outside of the politics and other, and other context. Um, I think in general, um, again, ma ma large agency transformation is going to be, be difficult. This is larger than just reengineering. Would, would you yield for one second, Mr. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Dominguez, would you have any objection to your department and, and Mr. Dunn, the same, Ambassador Dunn, sharing that information with the General Accountability Office so that they could do analysis, look at the data upon which you based uh, your determination to go to this particular pilot program? so that uh, we as a, as a panel could then in turn ask the General Accountability Office to give us their assessment of that? Um, yes, sir. We are uh, happy to share right. uh, with the GAO. And we will ask the General Accountability Office to take a look at that then and give us some idea of, of what your views are toward that data and how uh, Sure. And to date, um, the information exchange has been, been, it's been very good. And I must say that we have had a lot of cooperation and um, we have been riding herd as these things move forward and, and asking uh, for information as, it, as it's being which produced. Which is what we, we want and which is ask. hopefully what this will continue to do and that will give us better insight as well. Do you have any other questions, Mr. Uh, Chase? I, I think Mr. Pendleton wanted to just respond. Yes. Um, we lay out in our statement the challenge of placing these recovery coordinators. Dole Shalala recommended that these recovery coordinators come from the Public Health Service. The idea was that they be significantly high ranking and able to sort of break down bureaucracies bureaucracies and I think also not necessarily um, in either of the departments. Um, the, the decision that DOD and VA have made I think is that these are going to become, uh, be placed in VA. Um, that can work but I think that is going to require careful lines of accountability and, a, and, and other things as it goes forward. In terms of the information sharing which you touched on, um, th there has been some progress made. And I think the most important uh, thing that I saw in our review is there is a mark on the wall now. October 31, 2008, DOD has said, or DOD and VA have committed to have all information viewable, administrative and health information. So there is now a mark on the wall uh, for that. I don't, I, I'm not necessarily familiar with the history. There may have been previous marks on the wall, but, but there is one here. And in general, I think follow through after after the limelight fades, the spotlight fades, is what's going to be more important. These, these plans, many of them are quite solid, well thought, well thought through. I think the continued accountability, oversight, um, and, and keeping track of how well these things are being implemented is going to be key uh, over the long haul. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we have no intention of letting down the oversight from this end of it, and I know each of the departments feels a responsibility to do their own oversight. So. Uh, I hope we are going to err on the side of too much oversight as opposed to too little on that, much to the chagrin of some out there maybe, but I, I think it behooves us all to do that. Uh, can either Admiral Dunn or Mr. Dominguez give me an answer as to why the decision was made uh, to not use Public Health Service Commission Corps or similar people instead of VA people as these recovery uh, coordinators? Sir, I think uh, uh, we are going to uh, work with the Public Health Service as we put this recovery coordinator system together. Our, our two lead change agents, the two deputy secretaries of VA and Department of Defense have, have signed out a memo which says that we are going to uh, uh, put together a, a program and, and it will recognize that uh, Public Health Service has a consulting role with us, be part of the evaluation, et cetera. So they, but they, they will, will not be the actual um, recovery coordinators, is what you're saying. As, as the plan as put together now would have VA employees, new VA employees be the recovery coordinators. What do you propose to be the chain of command in that? Is this recovery coordinator, uh, as I understand, is going to be above the triad of, of individuals that General Schoomaker has on, on bases? Correct. Uh, and who are they going to report to? Or does the buck stop with them? Are they the patient's advocate or are they 
the department's advocate. They're the patient's advocates. And they get to make the final shot, or do they have to report up to somebody else? They, they will be of uh, position description such that they have the uh, seniority and the presence of mind to be able to understand the system and know when it's time to say, based on common sense, somebody needs to do something here and fix this problem. They will be coordinators. And they'll have sufficient rank so that when they say that, somebody will jump. That is the intent, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, Admiral and Mr. Dominguez, the uh, SOC is set to expire in May 2008. Are you going to be done by then? Sir, I think we'll, um, we, we hope to have made significant progress by May of 2008, but the, the, that date was uh, picked uh, back in May of this year uh, as a goal. We're going to work towards that goal, but we still have the Joint Executive Council, which is a joint VA and DO or, DOD organization, which will uh, pick up the mantle and uh, continue to follow through on anything that the SOC puts in place. Thank you. Sir, if I might just add, the SOC sure. was envisioned and created as a crisis response organization to drive change fast. The changes that get implemented then will transition to the day-to-day -day oversight of this Joint Executive Council. Um, and so that's where these changes will be institutionalized, implemented, uh, and sustained uh, for all time. Thank you. Now, we're going to have additional oversight hearings. It would be helpful for us to determine and, and ask for your cooperation with our staff on this, whether we ought to have individual hearings on specific aspects of the concerns raised by General Accountability Office. In other words, a hearing on disability evaluation in that process, a hearing on TBI and PTSD in that situation, one on data sharing, uh, and one on the uh, warrior transition units and their staffing up with, uh, on those matters, or whether we'll have another one in the aggregate. Could each of you just, in a couple of words or less, as I go down the line here, tell me when do you think would be an appropriate time for us to check back when we, we should be able to have answers to those as to how we're proceeding and a good idea that we're getting well along in our, our progress? On the, um, the issues re related to continuity of care, that is pretty much new work at GAO, and we haven't done a lot of tire kicking yet. So we want to get out to some units, see what the impacts are of some of these staffing shortfalls. So it would, need, it would take us a couple of months probably to be able to give you much new on that. Okay. And everything else? Um, on the uh, information technology, we have experts at GAO that have been working on that for a long time. I think they could come and, and have a hearing. They're following that actually quite closely, and we crib some of their work for this. Um, and on the uh, TBI PTSD, we have a team following that as well. There was a mandate for us to look at that in the National Defense Authorization Act last year. That team's starting up, but much like the continuity of care work that we're doing, it's, it's relatively new. Dan leads our disability stuff, so I'll let him answer that. Out of uh, 14, 15 uh, engagements I have, I probably have eight right now that are, are VA in it, or, or DOD looking at the benefits delivery of discharge system, voc rehab for returning warriors, um, overlaps, inefficiencies in the system. We're, we're about to kick a job off on looking at the uh, um, temporary disability retirement list for TBI patients, um, and uh, just a range of work that, that's relevant to what's going on here now. It's, we've been doing it for a couple months, and of course, in a f two, three, four months, if we were asked to come up and give you an interim report on any of those issues, we will be able to, to do that. And Thank you. Certainly the final report in eight or nine, ten months. Thank you. Josh Kumega, when should we next look at what's happening at Walter Reed and the other uh, 29 facilities in terms of uh, all of these overriding issues? Well, sir, one of our uh, milestone events is going to be January 08 when we say we will be fully operational capable for the Army Medical Action Plan. And uh, I would say any time after that, we, we should be accountable for how we're doing. Thank you. Mr. Dominguez? Um, sir, I, my suggestions w uh, would be that we, we're ready now on the IT uh, interoperability plans, what's going on, uh, where we need to go. Um, um, I think we're ready now on the TBI PTSD. Uh, again, that, that's ready now means to talk to you about where we are in this process. Lots of work in both of those in front of us, but we are ready now to explain them to you. Uh, in terms of the disability evaluation system, um, we're not going to actually walk people through that until November, uh, so I'd say in January is probably the right time, again, for you to take a deep dive into that and how it's working 
um, because that's when we're actually going to start up the new uh, system if, if all goes uh, well. Sir, uh, I agree with my partner on the timelines. What a surprise. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me just end. I, I want to make one last note uh, with respect to General Schoomaker. We heard some comments earlier about a number of the soldiers with whom we met uh, and their particular cases on that. Uh, I think in fairness we ought to note that uh, they were just introduced to a new ombudsman's uh, process as of last Friday. Uh, and you were kind enough to uh, discuss it with us on the ride out to Walter Reed the other day. Uh, maybe you'd spend one minute at least telling us that there were three, I think, that you uh, designated for Walter Reed and what you would anticipate their role being and whether they'll be replicated and when throughout the rest of the system. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about that. One of the things that we've tried very hard, and it distresses me, no, no question, to know that we have a, a single case within the hospital that, of, a, of, a, of a warrior in transition who is not pleased with his or her care and administrative oversight. Uh, we've tried to offer as many options for giving us candid feedback anonymously or, or directly with attribution from these soldiers, one of which is the, the ombudsman program. Uh, I think, sir, you had a great deal to do, uh, great deal to do with this, and that is uh, 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 patterned after uh, ombudsman in other uh, realms besides health care, uh, a truly objective um, arbiter that looks at the system uh, for the patient, looks at the system as, as a system and, and tries to figure out where are the points of weakness, where are the points of solution for that particular patient. And uh, we have, we are bringing those folks on, we are making them available to, to our patients uh, across, uh, the, uh, in Walter Reed and across the Army. We've also, uh, uh, every soldier is, get, is issued a 1-800-24-7 uh, line that they can uh, uh, the call and, and seek help uh, for themselves or their families. Uh, we are very, very sensitive about, uh, especially in our reserve component uh, colleagues, uh, their access to answers about w as, they, as, as symptoms may emerge or as uh, realizations about their disability or a potential disability emerge, uh, access to information is right, and, and that's available too. Thank you very much. I want to thank you. In fact, it was uh, a member, previous member of my staff that brought up the uh, ombudsman situation, and you were kind enough to accept the concept and work with him on that. He happened to be a, uh, a veteran himself, and so had an, an amazing thing as a number of veterans that are following what's going on with the progress on this and feel very committed to it. Can I thank each of you gentlemen for the commitment that you've made to helping us uh, make sure that something is done. I think we're all disturbed. Uh, everybody here is well intended. Everybody here is working hard at it. We may have some disagreements about whether it's fast enough or whether it might be done in a different way or how we can improve it. But nobody should doubt the commitment that's been made uh, to get this resolved. And I look forward to your cooperation. And, uh, and we hope that together we'll get this expedited. We'll put to it a sense of urgency uh, that is needed. Uh, and we'll get uh, the kind of treatment that our veterans deserve. So thank you all very, very much. And for uh, suffering through the interruptions that we've had today as well. Thank you. Tomorrow, a hearing on border security. The Senate Finance Committee will hear from the GAO and U.S. Customs.